Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to discuss what is radical feminism and we have Dorothea Anderson, me, Joe Brew, Cara Dansky, Sheila Jeffries, Leah Keith um, and Marion Rutiliano. We hope to get Leila Nam Darkan on, although she's not here, but there are plenty of us so and we'll get her on in the future if if she if she doesn't turn up so this is a live webinar sunday the 15th of january and the topic we have is um what is radical feminism um so great everybody's on screen so um this webinar aims are oh, brilliant here's layla <laughs> fantastic welcome layla we've we're started um we aim to answer the question what is radical feminism? You might be interested and in watching this because you're a student researching different strands of feminism, liberal, socialist, radical, or you might have been called a TERF, a trans exclusionary radical feminist and wonder what radical feminism means. And there might be any other number of reasons why you're interested in what is radical feminism. The internet and academia tend to present radical feminism as a movement from the 1970s uh, and they mention people like uh, Firestone and Kate Millett and give quotes from from those people and then say that radical feminism this is the presentation of radical feminism has been surpassed and updated by other forms of feminism and other ideas like gender critical feminism or postmodern feminism or intersectional feminism um which we say as a misconception we say as untrue there are many radical feminists um working today active today and radical feminism is alive and kicking in 2023 and uh we hope this webinar will give you an insight into what it is today we have seven long-standing radical feminists <laughs> to bring you an up-to-date discussion that we hope will clarify what radical feminism is and clear up some misconceptions. Now, if you're in the chat here today and you're on this live webinar, thank you so much for being here. Do put your insights and ideas into the chat and we will uh, join these ideas together and hopefully come up with a document. If you're watching later on YouTube, similarly, put your ideas in the comments and we'll continue to work on it because obviously the the this is not going to be the final word on what is radical feminism so um uh thank you so much for everybody coming and i'm going to hand over to marion to introduce a bit more um hi radical feminism is like um analogous to science people think that science means that you know a lot of specific facts but that's and that's what science is and you may indeed have a fund of knowledge of facts, but it's really a way of thinking and a way of approaching problems that makes it science. Radical feminism is not a set of conclusions that it, you have to, this is what we believe, you know, um, point of view, point of view, point of view. Um, it starts with a way of thinking and a way of approaching um, women versus versus men or women's existence. That's what it is. It's, it's a way of thinking and it, and it starts, you know, it starts very, very, very basic. It starts with the fact that we are born and we are born female. Feminism is about females, it's about women. Um, so where does that start? Well, it starts the way we are born. Um, we, have, um, we have a sex, we're born with a sex and things are attached to that sex that have nothing to do with that sex. The sex just means that's our reproductive class. We're born as, you know, a, a class of people <clears throat> who can bear children, um, things are attached to that, which we used to call sexual stereotypes and now call gender. Um, and then it functions like a caste system because you're stuck there your whole life um, with women as the lower class or caste and men as the higher or upper class. But the only criteria for this is biology. Women are a source of sexual services, um, sex and uh, reproduction. And these are resources that men desire for pleasure, for whatever else some you know it may be sexual pleasure it may just be the satisfaction of you know reproducing and they want unrestricted access to and control of and if you start with that um you can start to um develop all the other things that happen with radical femi feminism um and there are some fundamental things there are some core ideas that all of us here will agree on about what feminism is 
and, and what that means in terms of how women exist in the world in relationship to men. There are some things that, you know, as you go a little bit further afield, um, you know, we all have different opinions about some other things, but we're all going to really agree on some of the core things. So the, the basic question is, what is radical feminism? Is sex class the structural basis of oppression to women, um, that it's oppressor and oppressed, um, and it's, it's not about choice or equality? Um, where, do, where does everyone else start in terms of what radical feminism means? What's the, what's the core idea that sets everything off? So let's go to Sheila now. Um, I'm going to, and then we'll go to Leah. So Sheila and then Leah. Okay, I would say that feminist, radical feminism starts with a sex class analysis. The fact is that most of us who became radical feminists in the 1970s came from the left, and we understood the left had an economic class analysis, uh, and the working class were the, the most oppressed and the ones who would create revolution and so on. So the women came from the left and sought to understand the oppression of women as a class-based oppression. And a class-based oppression means that it's structural. It's not just some kind of you know, uh, discrimination based on no reasonable basis. It's structural, the working class is oppressed because they are exploited and the rich seek to continue this. So the situation with the oppression of, of women for radical feminists is it's structural. Uh, we are oppressed because men benefit. And as has already been said, they benefit from the control of women's bodies bodies sexually in reproduction, but also women's labor in every other way. Um, some of us and some women at the time, and I have since thought that caste might be better than class as a way of describing the situation of women, because class suggests that it can be overcome. Somebody can change their class and rise in their class status. Women can't do that. It's simply impossible and caste sums that up, meaning you are always in that situation. And the example I always used to give to students was the situation where a man burst into the queen's bedroom in Buckingham Palace. What she feared was rape, as all women do in that situation. And it didn't matter that she was extremely rich. She was a woman and she was in the caste of women or the sex class of women. So I think there's two different class and caste are both interesting ways of looking at the structural situation of women. Here. Yeah, I'm going to say pretty much what Sheila just said, um, that feminism, radical feminism came because women took the tools of political analysis that had been learned on the left. So in the civil rights movement, in the anti-war movement, in the labor movement, and applied those tools to our own lives. Because if you teach slaves to read, eventually they revolt. Um, and eventually what they really do is write their own political theory, which is what women did. Um, so taking this concept of a class or a caste, which had been learned on the left, and you apply that to women's lives, and all of a sudden, everything becomes really clear, from the small daily insults that all women endure to the really overwhelming traumas of things like incest and rape. But the crimes that men commit against women aren't done to women as random individuals. They're done because women belong to a subordinate class, and they're done to keep women a subordinate class. And that's what feminists began to see. So all the central elements of subordination, the hierarchy, objectification, violence, those were all happening to women, but mostly in the realm called private. And they were done by men who claim to love us through actions that men experience as sex. And that's the core inside of radical feminism. So liberal feminism takes the model of how men are oppressed and they apply it to women. So it tends to follow like the civil rights movement and other male struggles. So the ways that a given group is barred from full participation in public life. So things like employment or education or the law, and then it addresses those barriers. And that's not a bad thing, it needs to happen. I'm incredibly grateful that I can have a bank account in my own name, that I own my own house, that I can marry a woman if I want, like all of those things need to happen. But when you put women at the center of the analysis, you do get something different because women's oppression at heart is not about barriers to public life. It's about how the entire private realm is in fact political. So rape, battering, incest, prostitution, murder, those create a barricade of sexual terrorism. So keeping women out of civic life is really about keeping us dependent on our one private owner. And no leftist analysis has ever included the realities of women's lives. 
Um, and in fact, the left has delivered us up to all men collectively. And that was one of Andrea Dworkin's major insights was that the only difference between left and right is that the left wants women to be public property instead of private property, because the right wants us to be privately owned and the left wants women to be publicly owned. And hence you have practices like prostitution and pornography and all of this where women are supposed to just be you know, a public resource that men can access. So that is, would be my definition of radical feminism that at heart it's about um, understanding that the private realm is in fact the realm where women are most oppressed, where the, the worst horrors happen to women um, and, and it is about sexual pleasure for men, that this is all tied to their sexual response, which makes it incredibly hard to fight because of course it feels natural and they get an incredible uh, rush from it and an, almost an addictive rush. You know, the whole limbic system lights up when there's sexual arousal involved and that's what we're fighting. So that would be my definition as a start. All right, thanks Leah. Let's go to Dorothea and then Layla and I'm gonna get people to mute so we don't get feedback. So first Dorothea, then Layla. Oh, Dorothea, you're on mute. Everybody accepts you. <laughs> I did it earlier and, and forgot. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on, on the personal is political, um, following on from, from uh, what the others have, have said. And um, that's a was a key insight of the um and a key you know sort of technique that the second wave feminists used um was what they called consciousness raising and that was about women coming together in a in a group and sharing their experiences sharing what was happening to them in their day-to-day -day -day lives and that exposed all the things that Lier was talking about and it made women realize that it wasn't just them. They weren't the only woman that felt like that. They weren't the only woman that was, was being treated like that. It was a shared experience. So that became the, the, you know, one of the bases of political action. Now, what I think sometimes has happened, and that's why we've ended up with the um, choice feminism, um, where anything a woman does, if she says she's a feminist, is feminist, is I think the personal is political was misinterpreted by some, not, not by radical feminists, but when it entered sort of popular culture, um, because it then became like anything you do as, a, as an individual can be political. And, it, and it's not. And I think the big problem with the choice feminism is that it actually ignores what was the insight of the women's liberation movement, that the choices that women make are not free choices. We are raised in a patriarchal society. We're raised in a sex role that, um, you know, prepares us for being, um, you know, a servant of man, you know, sexually or, you know, through domestic labor, whatever, um, that raises us not to feel um, confident, to have low expectations. So the choices that we make are always constrained by that. We, you know, we are none of this is natural, it is a social construction. And again, I think one of the, the dangerous ideas that has, has come about is this idea of, is forgetting about social construction and seeing gender as some kind of natural behavior. And that is absolutely a political dead end for women because if feminine behavior, if, if the behavior of um, women as subservient to men is some kind how natural because they have an innate gender identity, then we have no basis for our political struggle and for ending that. So I was you know, that that's just what I, I wanted to say as a kind of why um, why radical feminists are opposed to the gender identity um, ideology and don't see gender identity as any kind of um, you know smashing the binary, challenging. Um, yeah, you know, heteronormativity. I mean, radical feminists talked about compulsory heterosexuality. I don't think that the way that the gender identity um, sort of activists see smashing it as actually a way that is going to be um, beneficial for women. I'll pass it on. Thank you very much. So we'll go to Layla and then Cara. Hi. Um, well, lo lots has already been said. It's sort of hard to find other responses in a way, that, uh, but there are many. 
I just would like to say that in a general sense, women's, for me, women's oppression is a universal phenomenon. And radical feminism has attempted through decades to unravel that universal phenomena. It's both historical, as uh, Gerda Lerner's books have indicated, and to my mind, it, women's oppression is the cause of misery for most women. Though psychodynamically hidden through years of misogyny that target women to deny their own oppression. Radical feminism leads to understanding of oppressive forms of ideologies that involve race, class, disability, belief, and so on. Crimes committed by men against women are normalized in most societies as if they are okay. Um, and, and it's been a radical feminism's job to dispel many of the taboos that women lived with prior to the second wave feminist uh, revolution or evolution. The idea that rape was a silent matter, incest a silent matter, battering a silent matter, men doing as they wanted with their property, i.e. women. And one of the greatest claims I make for radical feminism is that it dispelled those myths. It brought those myths into the public domain and made society extremely uncomfortable when those truths are revealed. And we are still in the process of revealing those um, wrongs and crimes that have been normalized and um, used to suppress women. Uh, though the views by radical feminists may vary, I think they're the core features that it, it's a universal historical phenomena, the, um, what I would call the subordination of women and girls by the patriarchal system. And that was fairly given until very recently when we had the introduction in the early 90s of what uh, we might call postmodernism that then brought us butlerism and queerist theory that maintained that there really isn't much you can do about all this oppression. So let's just get on and have a good time and nobody's really impressed. It's all oppressed. Brilliant. Um, Leila, I'm That's going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, come in here now and pass over to Cara and then we can go back to um we'll go back to Marion and then she'll just carry on going around okay Cara uh, good morning thank you everyone I I guess th the only other thing I would add is I think a, a really critical piece of this is the aspect of radical feminism that is waking up and I will just say that radical feminism saved my life uh, having woken up. And I noticed in the chat, a woman named Frances said something about there being a reason. There, there's a reason that all of this is happening. And I'll just share that for a, a while in my life, in my early 20s, I was somewhat mystified that men seemed to feel like they could just get away with raping and murdering and torturing women with impunity. And it didn't, it wasn't obvious to me why that was the case. And it was radical feminism that woke me up to the fact that, oh, there is this class-based oppression. There is a reason why this is all happening. As Francis said in the chat, there is a reason why things are so shitty for women and girls all over the world. And radical feminism for me is a process of waking up to the reality of that and being willing to face it head on. I wanna just, uh, get at the question that's been raised a couple times is, are we stuck here? And a couple of women have said, we're stuck here. And, and part of what I hear in that is the knowledge that we all have, that we are women and sex is not changeable. And we all know that. And are, so, so we are by definition women and we will never not be female, but that, does that mean that we are stuck in our oppression? And I just wanted to raise that as a question. That's all I'll share. Great, thanks, Cara. Um, I'm gonna say that I like radical feminism because of a lot of the fantastic books. So the ones I like, 
and make me feel this is a good analysis are by Sheila Jeffries, who we're very lucky to have here. Um, really, if you want to understand radical feminism, it's fantastic. Secondly, Andrea Dawkin, Mary Daly, who has fantastic insights, Lier Keith, who's here today as well, and has written some really good stuff, and possibly the most well-known and getting a reach out right now is Kara Dansky, who's here also right now. And it, uh, uh, what's remarkable about Kara is she gets onto quite mainstream um, programmes and she says she's a radical feminist. Now, most of the feminists who are getting airtime today start off by saying, I'm not a radical feminist. I'm not even a feminist. Whereas we have here today some uh, actual real radical feminists, and 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 I believe that the analysis is correct. Right, I'm going to pass over now to Marion and then Leah. Um, you know, hearing and seeing in the chat about well, we're stuck and there's no way out. Um, you know, I I like to use and I and I frequently use the analogy of um of a of a POW camp. I mean, radical feminism class analysis. Um, it's we're we're socialized into those oppressor oppressed roles from the from the second we're born. I mean, from even when the ultrasound says, "Oh, a penis is a boy," because if you have a penis, you're male, um, or or no penis, it's a female. We are socialized into this stuff from the from the second we're born, from the second um, the world knows whether we're male or female. So every decision that we make as individuals is in the context of this structure of men as the oppressor and women as the oppressed. Women will say, oh, you're, what about women's agency? Yes, you have agency to make all the decisions that anyone in a POW camp can make. You know, you can try to make the best deal for yourself. You can find a guard that isn't so bad that maybe you want to marry because he's one of the good ones. Um, you know, but you're all, you, know, you, can, you can do whatever you do, whatever you want to try to make life easier, to make it feel like, um, that it's not so bad being here or it really isn't a POW camp, but you're still there. And radical feminism recognizes that this is a systematic way that society is structured um, and that women need to break out of the prison. It's not just making the best deal for yourself within the prison, it's breaking out of the pr prison. All the things, you know, the, the fundamental principles of, of radical feminist analysis talk about that. And what, what we try to do when, you know, what the, when it was created, I mean, this, this was created, what, 50, 60 years ago, you know, I came to it in 1969, and it was really in the throes of being created. Um, and all, all, everything that was done was to allow women to, to escape, to abandon, to, to leave the POW camp, to abandon the guards. Um, and it relied on a couple of things is one, knowing that you were there, um, and two, prioritizing women. I mean, people are like, well, what about men's this? What about men's you know what, there's 8 billion people in the world, 4 billion of us are female. Um, so I'm going to take care of those 4 billion women. Um, and any men's problem you want can be problem number 4 billion and one. Um, but we prioritize women. Um, and we, when we prioritize women, the goal is A, to try and fight that socialization, but B, to escape, to abandon. Um, and it, um, fighting the socialization Lear made reference to for, for men, it's incredibly hard to fight because there is a, it's a self-sustaining system. There is absolutely no way that the oppressor class is going to give up all that privilege. They do not suddenly have an epiphany and decide, oh, this is really awful. I'm going to give all this up and, and be on a level playing field with the oppressed. That doesn't happen. So, so and if they keep getting you know, what they expect to get, um, there is no reason to change. It's a self-sustaining system. Boys are taught this from the day they're born. Every male they meet, even in the home, you know, moms treat their, you know, treat their sons differently than they do their daughters. Um, so, so the the how, what is the way out of it? The way out of this is to escape the prison camp, to abandon the guards, um, and to just not not go along with it anymore. Um, and to to realize that it's not a question of like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I have one of the good ones. I'm going to, you know, my life is really good. They're not all like that. You're still in prison. You know, I mean, you may have a good, a good guard, 
um, but but you're still you're still in prison, and the and the way out is to um, is to escape, not to just cope. Thanks very much. Okay, let's go to Leah and then Sheila. I would agree with all of that, and I also think that our goal is to destroy the prison camp because we've got to get all women out of it. It's not enough for me to escape. I don't want any woman in there. So I think the goal of radical feminism is to take that down. So that's the barricade of sexual terrorism. And that's what we have to destroy. Um, and I, I don't think that we're stuck here. I think that in my lifetime, dramatic change has happened for women. And if we look over the last you know, 150 years, huge amounts of change for good happened for women. I, I mean, I am just on a daily basis grateful for the first wave of feminists, particularly the radical ones who really did understand what we were up against. Um, and their goal in getting us the vote and in getting us you know, full participation in civic life, that was just the first step. Like they understood that rape and battering and incest were really the core of you know, the horrors that men were perpetrating against women. And that in order for women to fight it, we were gonna need some of these basic tools. So this was, they, they saw it as just the first you know, this is the first round of knocking the, the bricks out of that barricade of sexual terrorism. And they did that for us. You know, we can now run for office. We can now write our own laws if we want. You know, we can try at least. And in my lifetime, women did that. You know, they rape shield laws, for instance, so that women could go to court and try to prosecute rapists and their sexual histories wouldn't be used against them. Like that was brand new. Um, Catherine McKinnon came up with this phrase, sexual harassment, and she argued it before our Supreme Court to say this is a form of sex discrimination. It isn't just what men do to women in the workplace. It's actually a form of you know, male power over women trying to keep us out of the workplace, and it has a huge impact on women. And she won. And now there are sexual harassment laws. You, you're, not, you're legally not allowed to do this to women anymore. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but at least you have some standing if it does happen to you. Um, when my mother divorced my father in 1976, she could not get a credit card in her own name. Like it was a huge big deal. She had to fight with them to get a credit card. And I remember how angry she was. And I remember how angry I was on her behalf. That doesn't happen anymore to women. Like women changed all those laws bit by bit. So we have to see that it's going to be incremental bit by bit but we can't stop. Like we have to take all the tools that we have because we have enormous tools now. We're not where we were 150 years ago. And even though I absolutely see that the situation in many ways is worse because now we have you know, the internet that brought us pornography on a scale that was completely unimaginable, um, we can still fight, you know? but we, we, we just can't give up. And so women have come up with you know, amazing models, you know, even more recently in my lifetime, like, you know, the, what they call the Nordic model or the equality model to try to fight prostitution in the sex industry. I see this as absolutely, you know, the, the spear, that's the, you know, the edge, the thin edge of the wedge, we've got to get that around the world. It's until we break down, you know, men's sense of entitlement to buy women as commodities, to buy women in rape, um, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. That is really, to me, the core of patriarchy. So, but you know, there's hope because women around the world are doing it. You know, there's I think what seven countries, eight countries where they've actually got it going, and we just we can't give up. I know it feels hopeless some days. I know it. I know, but we are not hopeless. And what the women before us really did hand us some very powerful tools, and we just have to keep using them. So, thank you so much, Leah. We'll go to Sheila and then Dorothea. Yes. Now, I think somebody was saying earlier um, in this webinar, talking about, I think Cara talking about when she became a feminist and, and what that was about. And I was just thinking, how did I become a feminist, which gradually became radical feminism, was that I was lying underneath the stereo. I used to lie with my ear, you know, there were stereo on legs. It was about 1972. And I'd lie under it, listening to the radio and listening to music often in the living room. I can't even remember what was on the radio and what was being said, but I remember the moment I thought, I'm a woman. Now, that had never occurred to me. I'd never thought about what that could possibly mean because I'd always had a good brain. I was always seen, you know, seen as being one of the boys because I'm intelligent, interesting to speak to, etc. And I had that moment, 1972, I'm a woman, for God's sake. So that meant every time, you know, I went every time I met a man that I knew and I'd had male friends at the time said, do you think of me as a woman? What does that mean? So for the first moment that became clear 
that there was a difference. It was humiliating. The first time I realized I was a human, a woman was humiliating. Anyway, we'll leave that behind for now. I mean, obviously what happens as a result of that realization is that you realize more and more things, you know, you just have to, uh, you realize how significant and how widespread the oppression of women is. And I just thought I'd like to mention, in case I forget this today, there was something in The Guardian, an extraordinary report today on the fact that there's been a rise in boys and men who terrorize their mothers in the home and oftentimes kill their mothers and their grandmothers. Now, this is a very, very important recognition because it says that you know, the home isn't separate. Women's oppression is not just about um, getting equality in the workplace. Women are being terrorized and killed by those they've given birth to in their home because the structural oppression affects and constructs the home. So there's no point being romantic and trying to exempt the home from anything else. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to say was the problem with the word equality because it's being used a little bit in this discussion. Catherine McKinnon's very good on this. Uh, the problem with equality is it suggests, first of all, that men's position in the society is something that women can aspire to. That's not true. Men's position in the society is constructed out of the oppression of women. There is absolutely no way that we can have equality with men because they've created everything in the society to their benefit out of their uh, superior status. And Catherine McKinnon explains that what it means to, to, for women to actually have liberation is the destruction of everything that men have created in their image, because of course they've created sport in their image, they've created work in their image. I mean, how extraordinary is the concept of work by which women are supposed to have children and look after them in the home and also have another job where they go out and do that outside and they're supposed to not take the children and they have to express milk and so on and so on, and they never get the opportunities or the promotion or the pension that men get. This is an absurd system, so it has to be absolutely taken apart. So part Elements, you know, or, or when uh, very often they didn't even have toilets for women, and it's still difficult, I think. So we have, and the idea that in the debating chamber you have, you know, these two enemies debating each other, extraordinary, and not the way women would normally work. So all of the structures and concepts of the society in which we live were created by men in their image. Once we've torn all of that down, the idea of equality is ridiculous. I mean, there's ridiculous ideas in equality theory about how more women should become, you know, C CEOs of companies and so on, and women aren't risk-taking enough. So women are supposed to adopt the behavior of male dominance and then, you know, forget all these other uh, uh, problems and, and behave exactly like men. Of course, that absolutely doesn't happen. It's never going to happen. The idea of equality is an absurd idea, and it blames women for somehow not being able to break into the structures that men have created and be exactly like men. So we need to uh, get rid of it. The worst uh, concept, and it's often used, not by us, of course, is that of gender equality, which I think is absolutely hilarious because gender is a hierarchy anyway. So what on earth is gender equality? And I, I tend to think of, you know, two pairs of shoes, the high heeled shoe fighting it out with a boot or something. I mean, it really doesn't make any sense, gender equality, even less sense than sex equality. Okay, I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much. It's a real joy here, being here and listening to all of this. It's amazing. Okay, we'll go to Dorothea and then Layla. I can't remember a moment when I when I actually dawned on me about feminism. It just kind of, I think, seeped in gradually. Um, but I remember, I mean, you know, I mean, I think I'd always realised that the sort of being a girl and a woman was putting me in a box. I remember protesting at school about the fact that the girls had to do needlework and the boys were doing woodwork and metalwork and I wanted to do woodwork and metalwork, but I wasn't allowed, you know. And it, it, so it's, it's sort of always been there you know that kind of thing and I think discovering radical feminism and reading some of those really important writers that have been mentioned is an absolute real revelation in understanding this is how the world works I think that's really really valuable knowledge for all women can to get 
The difficulty is then, though, is what do you do about it? Because it is so hard to change it, as, as Sheila said. It means changing absolutely everything. Um, and I think, I like, like Lier, I was like, oh, well, yeah, OK, we've still got a long way to go, but, you know, we've, we've got more um you know sort of laws raping marriage has at least been criminalized i know it's not it's very hard to to prosecute but at least it says it's it's wrong more women getting into politics you, you know more women being mps it's it's not enough but it's just starting to to sort of chip away and then suddenly we walked into the most massive backlash that we've had in a long time which is actually made me realize again and i think i'd kind of got slightly complacent possibly is the word which I you know disconnected from things and this absolute realization that men do not think that women are human beings which I'd kind of known before and it's difficult to face up it's difficult to live your life you compartmentalize but actually you know when to them we're not human beings we're we're a costume we're a set of you know, feminine behaviours and actually women's voices, however many MPs we have, however many women we have in the media, that only certain voices are listened to and only certain voices are heard. So when radical feminists started speaking up against things and saying, you know, this is not, you're erasing women, this is actually just embedding um, our oppression, and it's not, it's not liberating, we have been absolutely dismissed and those women that have spoken out are demonized you know there's every attempt to shut us down and that sounds all a bit negative which you really want to be be negative but I I just think it is a massive massive task that we have and we're at a point when there's certainly this sort of shift now that um you know sort of linked to the idea of, of, of intersectionality um that I, I think you know, maybe Carver might be able to say something about that white middle class women are not actually oppressed. You, you know, that it completely banishes that whole radical feminist understanding of women as a sex class or caste, that we are all oppressed. It might vary in different ways in different cultures. It might vary in different ways over different historical periods. But all women are oppressed. All women are oppressed on the basis of our sex. And we all have to struggle against that. Thanks, Dorothea. <laughs> so we'll go to Leila and then Cara. Yeah, fa fascinating developments here, I think. One, one wonderful information for people coming coming to radical feminism or already in that in that mode. Um, I can remember at the age of 11, an incident in my household. I'm not an academic feminist. I come from a working class background, very poor, post-war. And my experience of poverty has stuck with me all my life and the discrimination that I observed my mother experienced. But on one occasion, she uh, had made overtures to buy a fridge. And she came into the house clapping a piece of paper. And although my mother was working and earning probably as much as my father in both the... Uh, domestic work that they did, uh, she had to get him to sign the paper for the higher purchase agreement. And I was absolutely, as an 11 year old, affronted by the fact that my mother had to ask him for signature on this piece of paper so she could buy the damn fridge. So my awakening to inequality and um, the lot of women came very early, even though I could not put the name to it. And it wasn't until later in the early 70s, I joined the Labour Party and uh, came in contact with uh, feminists uh, and was able then to put a name to what I had always, always felt about um, the status of, of myself as a woman. I knew I was a woman very early on, or a female <laughs> very early on, discriminated in, in education, in work, in, in all those things because I left school at 15 and work. So my, my radical feminism comes from my own roots of experience and my experience of meeting other women and consciousness raising groups where I listen to women for the first time talking about their abortion, about violence that they'd experienced, about sexual assaults, about rape, 
and lots of other things that they felt were wrong. I totally agree with Sheila's analysis of uh, equality. It's not equality for women, uh, thanks to the, uh, the powers that be, that we have to pay the same car insurance as men, because statistically men have far more accidents in cars than we do. And, that, and yet it was all um, leveled up so that we all paid the same level because it discriminated against men. So it's only men who, be, who, who have um, been the beneficiaries, in my opinion, of equality. Leila, I'm going to um, move on now to Cara. So thanks very um, much. <laughs> so Cara, uh, over to you. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just share very briefly. I have this very distinct memory of being maybe eight or nine and playing on the playground during school. And there was this boy. And for some reason, I have no idea why, he decided to start chasing me. And I ran from him. And he continued to chase me. And when he caught up with me, he shoved me to the ground. And I was annoyed by that. And I went to report it to the woman who was responsible. And when I reported that this boy had chased me and shoved me to the ground, her face lit up. And she said, oh, that means he likes you. So in that instant, my female brain absorbed the message that when a boy treats you violently, it means he likes you, and also that you are to be happy about it. And my own feelings about being shoved to the ground and my own feelings about him were utterly irrelevant. I was just supposed to be happy that first of all, a boy liked me, and second of all, that he liked me so much that he was going to treat me with violence. And so these messages get absorbed into our minds as girls and as women. And, you know, happily, because of radical feminism, I was able to pick through that and, and realize that, no, this is so utterly wrong. It is just wrong and it is unfair and it is cruel that a boy ought to be able to chase a girl down on the playground and shove her to the ground with impunity and face no consequences. And the woman who was supposed to be there supervising was happy about it, right? So there's there's a lot for us to do here, but the beauty of radical feminism is that it cuts through all of that bullshit and it teaches women and girls that no, we do not have to accept this. We absolutely do not have to accept it. Um, Joe, I could say something about intersectionality, but I know we're limited on, should I say? Okay, so I know that most of us know that Professor Kimberly Crenshaw's views on intersectionality have been totally warped by gender identity nonsense. And most of us know that Professor Crenshaw was talking about the intersection of sex and race-based oppression. And that's been totally warped by the nonsense that men can be women. But what many of us don't know is that her analysis was a very specific legal analysis that arose out of a specific case in which a black woman was looked over for a job and she sued on the basis of both sex and race discrimination. And what the court said is that she was not discriminated against on the basis of sex because the company did employ women, which they did. And she was not discriminated against on the basis of race because the company did employ black people, which they did. What the court completely ignored is the fact that 100% of the women that were employed by the company were white women who were employed in secretarial roles. And 100% of the black people who were employed by the company were employed in manual labor roles. So the only women that the company employed were white women who were secretaries, and the only black people that the company employed were black men who were manual laborers, and 100% of the leadership was white men. And the court just ignored this. And so Kimberly Crenshaw, in her thinking about it, had the realization that this particular woman was in fact discriminated against on the basis of both race and sex discrimination, but the court couldn't see it because the company in question did employ some women 
and the company in question did employ some Black people, and the court simply ignored class analysis. And I just think that's really important for us to think about and know that intersectionality initially was a very sophisticated legal analysis developed by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, and it's just been totally warped. And I, I just wanted to share that it it's not just the basic idea that Black women are oppressed on the basis of both sex and race, which is true, but it derives from a very specific legal case that Kimberly Crenshaw picked apart and analyzed and shared her analysis with us. Great. Um, I would, I'll add that a reason I like radical feminism is the idea that a lot of everything is joined together. And it's something that Virginia Woolf said that Mary Daly mentioned that the best thing for her life and that she enjoyed most was putting the pieces together. And I love that. And that, that sort of links to what Cara's just said about the uh, intersection of, of, or the joined up of nature of two oppressions. Um, I'd also like to add that I, really enjoy um, reading radical feminists. So, so I was laughing when Sheila was talking and often if I read her books, I'm, I laugh and or when she's talking. And the same with Mary Daly, who has, it's a sort of way through to joy. And Mary Daly talked about metapatriarchal consciousness, which was a big moment for me. She really explains that we can move outside patriarchy. There are places, metapatriarchal places, that we have now and that we want to build. And that's part of the solution. So I think she certainly gives lots of really clear ways that we can find solutions. Then the other thing I wanted to say is that I spent quite a lot of time in progressive left wing unions. And what I always found when I got to know them is they're anti feminist and they demand that I'm anti feminist, one by shutting up about feminism, but two by prioritizing their male struggle. So it might not be have to be explicitly pro porn, but you have to prioritize the male worker or that analysis. And if you don't do it, there's no place for you in the any male progressive movements. I think there's that I, when I realized there's just no place for me at all, that m made it more clear that the only place is women only organizing in radical feminism. OK, we've only got 12 minutes left, so I'm going to go to Marion, Lear and then round everybody and try and have about two minutes each. OK, so back to Marion. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and then you after all this is like, what do we do about it now? Well, you know, we knew back, you know, back in the day, there were disagreements, strong personalities. But we all knew that the enemy was patriarchy and that men are patriarchy. Um, so we talked about and women need to start talking again about things like separatism, about heterosexuality, um, you know, about that it's not about equality. Um, and that doesn't mean that everybody has to, you know, go off and become lesbians and live in and live in uh, women's land communes. That's not what it means. Um, or about having male children. And that doesn't mean that every woman has to, uh, you know, abort a male pregnancy. Um, that's not what I'm saying. But that, but that these are things that shape um, how we uh, ha shape um, how we are oppressed in the world um, and and what men can can do with this. So. Um, Politically, we organize as women only. It's like, you know what? Men can take care of themselves. It's like, oh, poor men, we need to, it's like, no. It's four billion of us, men can be four billion and one. Um, we organize separately um, as, uh, you know, as um, politically um, so that we can focus only on our own interests. Um, and, and, and our own interests have a lot to do with, um, you know, women who partner with men, um, women who have those, you know, those sons who, uh, who become, you know, murderers or, or abusers in the household. Um, and, you know, these boys, some of these boys are becoming unsalvageable at very young ages. We're going to have to figure out what to do with them. Um, but the hope, but the idea is just the, the destruction of all these things that maintain the oppression one by one. Um, and it's not, it's not having to do with equality. I don't want to be equal with men. Male, male socialization creates lesser human beings. It's not genetic. I mean, that's what it creates. A world of male socialization is not going to be um, is not going to be a healthy or or satisfying world to live in. So I don't want to be equal with that. 
they may want to be equal with, to us <laughs> and to how we are socialized. Um, so, so okay, I'm going to have to butt in and go to Leah oh, and I'm then done. Sheila. Mm -hmm. um, I was passing around an article this week about a TV show that I think is in the UK right now or will be soon, where they took 10 10 10 year old boys and they put them in a house for five days and then they did it again with 10 girls the same age and the boys essentially wrecked the place they threw everything all over the walls uh they hit each other with objects they did not cook a single meal they just ate junk food the entire time um and they created a hierarchy there were the boys on the top in one group and then there was a subgroup of boys on the bottom and this was i think utterly predictable they basically went lord of the flies um, and then they did it with the girls and guess what? Um, the girls sat down and made all their decisions together. Uh, the very first night, one of the girls volunteered to make dinner and she did. And then they made a chart of chores to keep the house rolling so that everybody participated. And it's not that they didn't squabble, but they always came back together and figured it out. So I am always left with why are men in charge of anything? How is it not obvious who should be in charge of the world at this point? Um, and I, yeah, and I, I mean, I always am also left with this question of how much of this is biological, but even if some of it is more biological, they still shouldn't be in charge. Like that's not an excuse. We can all see that men have had 10,000 years and they've wrecked the planet. So enough already, you know, women know how to get this done. And I'm just going to give one small anecdote. When I, um, the year that I went to Michigan to the women's music festival, um, I was told what an incredible experience it was to be sitting in the airport because I was waiting for friends. We all had different flights in. And every time a, a flight would land, there would be this wave of women would come down the runway, you know, off into the airport. And it was all, you know, mostly lesbians and everybody's got their knapsacks and they've got their buttons and their, you know, whatever. And it's like, it's just like all the women gathering and they all look like me and like they're all my sisters. And you just felt that incredible love. Like every time another plane landed, it was like, wow, the women are gathering. But the incredible thing was to watch how everybody behaved in the waiting room of the airport. Cause I was there for about four hours waiting for my friends. And there were two, two things that I really remember was that, so I'm sitting there by myself. Um, and every time a plane landed and that wave of women came through at least one woman would come over to me and say, are you okay? Do you have a ride? Are you lost? Do you need help? I'd be like, no, no, I'm just waiting. It's fine. We've got a car. I'm just, you know, they're they're coming from different places. And then the second question was always, do you have food? Do you want some snacks? And I was like, this is the world women would create. Like there it was. Are you okay? Do you need food? How can I help you? You know, just that care and connection. These are utter strangers to me. And there was one woman there who I watched this whole thing. She was deaf and she had missed her connection somehow. And she was surrounded by this circle of women, maybe 10 women who were just like not going to leave her side until she was safe. So they're making all these phone calls. They're trying to figure out, you know, who is supposed to be picking her up? Like, where are her friends? What's happened? Where did this all go wrong? I was like, I don't need to get in on this. Like, there's enough women around her. But they, you could just see these women, they were not leaving that airport until that woman who's, you know, a little more vulnerable until she was safe. And I always come back to that. Okay, experience. sorry, Leah, yeah. I'm going to move on yeah. to yeah. Sheila. Right, so Sheila and then Dorothea. Yeah, um, a couple of things that we haven't really mentioned, but that I think we need to deal with if we're going to create our revolution is the way in which women are constructed and controlled through uh, gender and femininity, let us say, and through the construction of sexuality. Because of course, it is the way women are constructed, they are constructed to believe that it's somehow natural uh, that women should do should be feminized, that they should be half naked, their legs, shoulders, back, stomachs, etc. that they should be made up, that they should have long hair, they should wear high heeled shoes. You've heard me spoke about this before, but it's still seen by many women as natural. It's not understood that we need to throw off the terrible yoke and oppression of femininity in order to reach our freedom. So that's fundamental and that's fundamental to radical feminism. I think other forms of feminism don't recognize that. And also it's, it's radical feminists who have recognized that we are constructed sexually to be subordinate to men, to eroticize our own uh, subordination, to fall in love, romantic love comes out of all of this. And the heterosexuality itself is constructed as an institution. It's one of the fundamental institutions of male domination and women can get out of it and become a revolutionary force by becoming lesbian feminists. So those are very fundamental issues 
that need to be understood if we're going to move into the future of a new attempt to have a revolution for women. Great, thanks. So Dorothea and then Leila. It's hard to know what more to add, so I shall just say, I just think this has been really valuable uh, to listen to you all and to, and to hear your ideas. And the chat has been fascinating, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to reading it later. But really, radical feminism, I think, is our only hope. Um, you know, if, if we can't share these insights and get women um, to understand and to use them, um, we, that there is no other way out. Thanks very much. Uh, Leila and then Cara. Yes, um, I think one of the things we have to remember about radical feminism that I've certainly learned along the way is that it is progressive but abrupt. And, and this is uh, difficult for us, but we cannot sanitize our beliefs just to suit the fact that quite often what we hear is unpalatable. Both Dworkin and Greer, Greer have said, unless women face the reality of their oppression, their use and abuse, nothing can change. But it's a harsh look that is very problematic. But we must keep our message clear. We must know what is radical feminism and what is not radical feminism. That's, that's what I'd like to leave you all with. And thank you for hearing me today. Thank you, Leila. Uh, so, Cara. So I'll just say, I have a friend who lives outside Washington, D.C., and this is on the topic that Joe mentioned about being in male-led progressive movements. And this woman was very active in the late 60s and early 70s in the anti-war movement. She was very active in fighting the war in Vietnam, which is a very good thing to do. And she once got a flyer on her college campus that invited her to a women-only women's liberation meeting in Washington, D.C., and she went to it and she told me that it absolutely changed her life. And although she continued in the anti-war movement, because it's good work to do, it was good work to fight the war in Vietnam, this women only, women led, women's liberation meeting absolutely changed her perspective on everything. And she never viewed, although she continued in progressive leftist movements, she never viewed her role in those as the same ever again. And she refused to submit to male domination, including on the political left. And I just find that story really inspiring. Thank you so much for this conversation today. It's been really wonderful. Fabulous. Well, we've, um, we've started to articulate what radical feminism is. Um, there's been a lot of interesting ideas in the chat. And we'll, I'll put them or somebody, some of us will put them together into some sort of document. And we're going to revisit this again in radical feminist perspectives. Now, if you're new to radical feminism, there are um, nearly 100 radical feminist perspective webinars about all different aspects of, of radical feminism. And you can see them on the YouTube channel that you found this on. And we've also got a button with all of those radical feminist perspective talks, so you can sort them by author or who's discussing it. If you want any more information, you can also email info at womensdeclaration.com and we'll try to put you in touch with other radical feminists. <laughs> so um, thank you so much to all our panelists and thank you for being here in the webinar. But if you're watching later, thank you for watching and see you at another one soon. Okay, bye.